Good evening, everyone. I'm uh, not 100% sure how to do this because I'm told I'm being translated. So since I can't hear the translator, I, I assume that I'll just keep going and everything will be okay. I would have much rather have been there with you in person. I'm told it's a beautiful place. And um, actually one of the young ladies that works with our ministry now, she is from Indonesia. And if you were to ask me what part exactly, I wouldn't be able to tell you, but she was excited that um, this was happening. I'm going to share my screen before we pray so we can go through these presentations. Let's open with a word of prayer before we begin. Father in heaven, we ask, Lord, that you would send your spirit to be with us. Lord, we see the things happening in this world and realize there is not a lot of time left. We realize that we need to be ready. We need to have clean hands and a pure heart. We ask, Lord, that you would attend each person who's here, speak to them, and we ask, Lord, that you would um, help us to understand that the condition of our hearts needs to be um, changed to be ready. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we are going to start by, with a text from the Bible. And it's where the title of this presentation comes from, The Lust of the Flesh. We're going to open in actually 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. It says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Just after this passage, we're told of the deceptions that will happen in the last days. And so it is a call that in order for us to be ready to withstand those deceptions, in order to be ready for Jesus to come, the condition of our heart needs to change. And we're going to cover these three categories of temptations as we um, go through this series. So, whatever you watch, whatever you read, whatever you listen to, is shaping who you are and what you want to become, all right? Which means you should be asking yourself, what do I want to become, all right? And along with that, what am I watching? What am I reading? What am I listening to? Because all these things, they influence you. They teach you. And they send you messages. So that's why it's very, we have to be very careful what it is that we allow into our mind. When... We, um, when we look at this principle, one thing we don't often think about is how we are molded by how we're exposed to the things around us. And I have this little graphic on the, the screen that shows us, you know, the, for example, if you listen to a song, the first time you listen to a song, you're like, yeah, I don't know if I really like that. I mean, it's okay. You listen to it to a few more times and you're like, yeah, you know, I like that song. And then after a few more repetitions of listening to the song, your reaction is like, it's my favorite song. I want to listen to it all the time. When, you know, from the very first, you weren't sure if you even liked it. But the more you're exposed to it, 
the more it becomes familiar to you and the more it influences you. And so that's what we're talking about. And this, this is called the mere exposure effect in psychology. And the mere exposure effect is a phenomenon that, um, by which people tend to develop a preference for the things that they're familiar with. In other words, the more you see something, the more you listen to something, right? The more familiar you are with it and the more comfortable you are with it. In other words, um, we kind of, well, I should say, we kind of know this by intuition. If you think about it, um, if you wanted to befriend like a wild animal for, you know, like a deer or something, I don't know what you have in Indonesia, but let's say you have this wild animal, you know, something that it doesn't seem all that intimidating. Maybe a squirrel. I don't know if you have those either, but uh, the first time you show up and you see that animal and they see you, you know, there's a little bit of tension. You're not sure of each other. But if you kept doing that every day, day after day after day, and every day that you've seen that animal, you moved a step closer and a step closer and a step closer every day. And then pretty soon you had some food in your hand. You know, they'd be able to smell it. They could smell you and you would become familiar with each other. And you might get to the point where you were able to touch that animal, right? Because you have been exposed to each other because you're familiar. That's exactly what happens with so many things around us. Uh, what we watch, what we listen to, what we read, right? What we watch on TV, movie, ever being exposed to these things. And the more we're exposed, the more we're familiar and it affects us. You also see this in the financial world. It's actually really kind of interesting. Um, when people are trading stocks, they will oftentimes you um, purchase domestic stocks because they're from more familiar with them. Even though international stocks have a better return and they're doing better in the market, but because they're not used to those, they won't buy them. So this happens all the time. And there's another realm that you see this all the time as well as the advertising industry. The more you are exposed to like all these things that you see on the screen, there are so many different brands. I mean, if I'm looking at this, I see, you know, T-Mobile, AMC, Dave and Buster's, Starbucks, and all these different theaters. I see Jay-Z. I mean, there's just so much packed into here. And you see that. And what advertisers like to do is they like to put something in front of your face over and over and over and over again, because the more you see it, they know about the mere exposure effect. And the more you see it, the more likely you are when you go into the store to buy it because you're familiar with that. You see this happening with politics um, in the United States when they're having times for elections. They'll put out all these signs and advertisements everywhere for a candidate. And you don't know who these people are because they're local elections. And if you go in to vote, who are you likely to vote for? You're probably going to vote for the name that you seen the most on an advertisement. You don't even know if it's the best candidate. You don't necessarily know what they believe, what their uh, stances are on various issues, but because you see their name over and over and over again, it affects how you vote and how you think. So I want to look at some examples um, of the advertising industry. You know, they're very clever and they use things to catch your eye. And um, they're trying to really communicate something to you in a lot of their graphics. And so I'm gonna show you some examples of this that I think are really, really clever. Here's one from the Pittsburgh Zoo. Now, different people see different things. Um, some people see a tree. And I can't see you all, so I can't say, you know, show me your hands to say who sees a tree. But there's something else in this photo. There is a gorilla and there's a lion. 
that make up the tree. They're in the negative space is what we call in, in the art world. And you'll notice there's fish at the bottom of the graphic that are swimming and there's birds uh, in the tree, you know, above the trees. And this is for a zoo. You know, you go and you go see the animals. And if you're having a hard time seeing it that way, I reversed it so that you could see the negative and that might make it a little easier for some people. But this is trying to communicate something to you. You know, it's a piece of art that's done in a particular way. And um, it's trying to communicate that uh, they have, it's natural. They have animals, they have this, they have that. Um, so it's a very clever example. But there's another one. This is for a, a chocolate company. It's, it's Hershey's Kisses. This is a very popular brand in the US for sweets. I don't eat them. I think it's too sweet. Not very good for you. But even in their logo, I'm going to show you um, that there is a Hershey's Kiss, which is this little uh, chocolate. And they, they make them in a particular shape. And so if you look at their logo, you'll see it's right there. They actually put the shape of the candy in their, in their uh, logo. It is very clever. So they're subtly trying to communicate something to you. Every time you see that graphic, they want you to think about the shape of the candy because they want the two associated. Here's another one, uh, uh, Tostitos, which is uh, mostly known to be a, a chip company. And Tostitos is also trying to communicate a message to people. Every time you buy a bag of chips, there's something else they want you to see. In the middle, there are two people and they are eating chips and salsa. So every time you pick up a bag of chips and you see the logo, the message is, well, you should buy some salsa as well. It's a subtle way of them communicating to you. And every time you buy the salsa, of course, it has the same logo. And what that's communicating is, well, you should buy a bag of chips, right? So they're subtly sending messages. They're subtly trying to say something. All of these are communicating a message to you in some way or another. There's also Amazon. You've probably heard of Amazon. I think everybody in the world's heard of Amazon. And Amazon, um, some people have seen this, some not. I'll just show you. They have everything, right? Everything from A to Z, right? And so in the English alphabet, that's the first and the last letter. So everything from A to Z, they have everything. And that's what I think of when I think of Amazon. I say that all the time. Amazon has everything. Why would I go anywhere else, right? Because they have everything. And it's designed in the shape of a smile. You're supposed to put a smile on your face. You're gonna get it fast, you know, a couple days. It's gonna come right to your house. You didn't have to shop for it except to go online. And so these are subtle messages that they're communicating to you about their brand. Um, and about how they want you to view their brand. There's also FedEx. Now, some of you have never seen what I'm about to show you. And when I show you, it's just gonna like blow your mind, okay? This happens all the time. I show people and they're just, they've never seen this before. But FedEx, there's actually something subtle between the E and the X. There's an arrow right there. And if you've never seen that before, now every time you look at the logo, you will always see it. You'll never be able to not see that again. So it's trying to communicate something to you, right? They deliver packages. They're, they're always moving. And an arrow kind of directs you in a particular movement. In this way, it's going forward, right? They're trying to get you to see that they're always moving forward, trying to get your package to you. It's a subtle message that they're trying to communicate. And so brands use, um, they oftentimes have slogans that they associate with their brands. And these slogans are supposed to influence you. You know, they're supposed to tell you something about them. There's Apple and IBM. They're two very large technical companies. And Duke University did a study on these two companies years ago. And it was on something called brand exposure, which is if I see the brand and I'm exposed to it over and over again, how does that affect me? Does it affect my thinking? 
So in a study, what they did is they said, okay, we're going to take the Apple logo and the IBM logo, and we're going to take two groups of people, and we are going to show them the logo, but so fast they don't see it. So it's subliminal. Um, it's showing up in the bottom of a screen, maybe once every 30th of a second. So very, very fast. And to distract people, what they did is they said, okay, we're going to put numbers on the screen. And every time a number comes up, we want you to add that number to the next number and just keep a running total. Like do the math. How much is this adding up to? Well, uh, they did that with both groups. One, they had the Apple logo, the other, the IBM logo. And at the end, they kept the two groups separate and they said, okay, now, we're going to give you a brick, set it on the table, and now we want you to tell us all the different ways, creative ways you can use a brick. Well, I mean, how many ways can you use a brick, right? I mean, I think you can use a house, I mean, you can build a house with it. Uh, you could throw it at a window if you needed to break one. <laughs> Yeah, I just don't think there's a lot of uses for a brick, right? I mean, it just, it's a pretty simple object. But what they found is that the people who were exposed to the Apple logo had many more creative uses for a brick than the people who were exposed to the IBM logo. Okay? Well, why, why is that? Well, they're proposing the reason is because of their, um, their slogans. The IBM slogan is just think, right? That's all it is, is think, one word. And Apple has a slogan that says, think different, right? Which suggests creativity. Don't just let your mind run in the same channels, think, you know, outside the box, that's thinking differently, right? And the people that usually buy Apple products are people who are very creative. They think very differently. And so they've, they've realized that uh, people who are exposed to even that logo, um, it causes them to even think differently. It's like it, it causes them to be more creative. Um, and I think what Apple was doing when they came out with their slogan is they were kind of directly, um, not really attacking, not attacking, but directly saying something to IBM. It's like, yeah, you guys tell us to think, but we're going to tell everybody to think different. So it's kind of an interesting um, study. And there's a variety of ways that advertisers will, will appeal to you. Um, one of the primary ways that they do this is by emotions. They love to appeal to your emotions. They know that if they can get to your emotions, it can cause your body to release certain chemicals and you will be inclined to attach that emotion to their product, right? And if you attach that emotion to the product, then every time you see the product, you have this positive emotional attachment. And they really like that. If you have a positive emotional attachment, then as you see their brand, as you become exposed, when you see the brand, if you have the right emotion, it's going to cause your body to release certain chemicals. And then when you see the product in the store, you want to buy it. It's very simple. And they figured out how to do this different ways. And they'll appear to, they'll, they will appeal to your emotions in very different ways. They might use an endorsement. So an endorsement is uh, you see a celebrity, right? Maybe um, LeBron James and he has the Beats headphones on. And so that's an emotional appeal because you think, well, I want to be like him. He's really good at basketball. Maybe if I wear those headphones, I'll be really good at basketball too. Um, there's the testimonial. There's somebody, they use a product, you know, they, they say, I drank this weight loss shake and I lost 50 pounds. And so that appeals to your emotions. You think, wow, maybe I could lose 50 pounds if I drank that weight loss shake too. 
Um, there's things like durability and status. There's uh, potential. There's adventure. Uh, people will use statistics. You know, they'll tell you um, one in three people who drink um, Coca-Cola are happier. I don't know if that's true, but they might say something like that to get you to say, hmm, if I drink Coca-Cola, maybe I'll be happier, right? Appealing to your emotions. Then they'll present things like a problem and a solution. Like um, if you can't type fast enough, you need my typing course because it will help you type faster. And so by seeing the problem and the solution, you think, wow, I would like to be able to type faster. And so you want to buy their product, right? Or they'll use music or they'll use something like to tell you the product is very rare, you know, like only one in a thousand people have this item. So you should buy it. Or they'll use fear. If you don't buy it, you're going to be left out. Your friends won't like you or something. Or they'll use romance or they'll use popularity or youth. They have so many different ways to appeal to your emotions, but that's what they do. And so I could have thrown in some videos, but I didn't. I almost wish I should. I uh, almost wish I did to show you this technique because it's actually very powerful and it works a lot. There's one um, commercial I seen. It's for uh, extra gum. And it had no dialogue. No, the only words were at the very end. It was just music. And you're watching this father and daughter, father and daughter. And they're just going through life. And every life moment that they have, the father would give his daughter a piece of gum. And after she was taking the gum, he would take the wrapper and he would make a little origami bird out of it and give it to her. And so you see this happen over and over and over again. She's at different stages of life, sometimes happy, sometimes sad. And then it shows you this scene where she's getting ready to move away from her parents' house. And the father is putting stuff in the back of his vehicle. And as he's doing that, he hits the band and it knocks over a box. And in the box, the box falls to the floor and out of the box spills all the origami birds. She kept every single one of them that her dad had made. And so it's this very powerful, emotional uh, appeal that they're making to you as you watch this commercial with no words. You're just watching people live life. But the next time you see that gum, you have all these memories. They're not even your memories. And you have all these good thoughts, you know, and you want to buy it in the store because you feel so good about their brand. And this is the kind of techniques that they do um, to appeal to your emotions. Um, but we're not just emotions as human beings. We are a biochemical machine, right? We, when we get these emotions, we release a variety of chemicals in our body because that's how we're made. And, um, and it's, uh, it's very powerful. And we have all these natural responses that happen because of it. And so some of these chemicals that are released are things like dopamine and serotonin and oxytocin and endorphins. These are the happy chemicals, right? And advertisers know exactly how to get you to release certain chemicals so that you'll respond in a happy, positive way to their product. Um, any or all of these can be released and get you exposed to them um, and get you to bring out the right type of emotions. And I will look at, like, at one in particular um, this evening with you, and that's dopamine. And dopamine works on this uh, pleasure reward type of response. When you see something, you listen to something uh, that's pleasurable, and there's all kinds of ways that your brain finds pleasure. It doesn't mean that it's something evil. Uh, it's just something that your brain likes. What happens is your body, your brain releases dopamine. And so it makes you feel good. And when you feel good, you think, wow, I want more of that. 
And so you try to repeat the behavior, do it again and again and again. And what happens is you form habits. And that's just the way we're made. It's not necessarily bad. It's just the way God made us. In fact, um, I can show you some of the ways that this is used. It's used in um, sexual encounters. God just made us that way. Our brain releases these happy chemicals when these things happen. It's released when we eat food. God designed our bodies so that when we eat food, it would be pleasurable to us. And that's really clever because if you think about it, you need to keep eating, right, to survive. And so it just makes sense that you would have that reinforcement. And so it's like almost like a survival mechanism. Yeah, I eat food. It makes me feel good, too. And so you keep eating and, and you know, you enjoy it and you go about your life. Um, but it also is the same thing that's released when you gamble. You play the lottery or slot machines or whatever. It's the same thing that's released when you smoke, when you drink, right? Or even when you use electronic devices and you're on social media, same thing, same chemicals being released. Uh, and so we see all these things um, and we use them and we are, uh, we're driven to repeat the same behaviors. Now, I think it's interesting, at least in the United States, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this place, but there's a place in the United States called Las Vegas. And it's where almost all the gambling happens in the United States. But there's a lot of other things that happen too. Um, in the US, it's known as Sin City. There's so many terrible things that happen there. But they have the sexuality, they have the food, they have the slot machines, they have all these things. And they're you know, people keep coming back as they get pleasure. They keep repeating those same habits. And what we have to be careful of is those habits that become destructive because not all of these things are good for us, right? Gambling is not something we should be involved in. Smoking is not something we should be involved in. And drinking is not something we should be involved in. Sexuality is something, it's fine, as long as it's in the marriage context, Right? That, there's nothing wrong with that as long as it's put in the proper context. But when it's taken out of that context, you can get addicted and form destructive habits. And actually the same thing with food. Yes, we should eat and we should enjoy food. What we shouldn't do is overeat, right, to our own destruction. So we have to be careful and we have to think about these things. Another um, chemical I discovered uh, recently that's kind of playing in all of this is it's called glutamate and glutamate is like this glue that holds these bonds together in your brain when it releases these chemicals because they'll release and they'll form a bond and uh, those bonds because of glutamate they're very hard to break they're very hard to dissolve and if you know um, a little bit about your brain whenever you make uh, whenever you do something, it's like a wire is formed in your brain. And that wire, every time you do the same activity, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay. And since your brain is like an electrochemical computer, the next time you do that thing, it becomes easier and easier and easier because electricity always follows the path of least resistance. And the path of least resistance is in the biggest wire, right? So the more you do something, it becomes a habit, the more you will do it. And in order for that to be um, stopped, you know, they say it takes about 40 days to break a habit. In order for a habit to be broken, that connection in the brain actually has to physically break. It's pretty amazing. Now, in the Bible, there's this place in the beginning that God made, and it was called the Garden of Eden. And if this was more interactive, I would, I would pull the audience and ask you a question. We're not able to do that right now. But what's interesting is what this means. The word Eden means pleasure. So this is actually the Garden of of pleasure. 
God designed human beings to have pleasure, to enjoy pleasure. He built us that way. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, what becomes a problem is when we go outside of the boundaries that God has set in place for pleasure. Um, so that is exactly what Satan is trying to do to us. And he is trying to exploit pleasure to our own destruction. He's using something that God made uh, to be enjoyed to take us off track. Genesis chapter three says this in verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, when Eve picked the fruit, it was appealing to her flesh, right? It was appealing to her. It was appealing to her desires. There was nothing wrong with the food itself. But God, just like what happens in advertising, God made an association. So he said, this fruit, if you eat it, you'll die. Okay. And it's not that the fruit was poisonous. You wouldn't die because eating it was poisonous. You would die because eating it, you're going outside of God's plan. When you go outside of God's plan, that's sin. And sin causes death. Right? So, when God said don't do it, then that action of eating the fruit became sin. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. Right? It's been that way from the beginning. And it's going to be that way all through the end. The wages of sin is death. Nothing has really changed. So when Paul wrote that the wages of sin is death, he was just stating, stating something that God had set in motion a long, long ago. And so here we find ourselves in this situation of good versus evil. Uh, there's a war going on, and that war is primarily going on in your heart. And what you need to ask yourself is, who will I give my heart to? You have to make a choice, right? Every single day. Who am I going to give my heart to? And so we're, we're, we find ourselves struggling between these two concepts. One of them is devotion, right? Devotion is how we are to respond to God and his word. And the other thing that we're struggling with is desire, right? What we want. And so it was never designed that we should be that way. But man, when man sinned, he chose to go a different direction. And now each one of us have this struggle, devotion or desire. Are we going to do what God asks or are we going to do what we want? In... Uh, philosophy, they actually have a term uh, for this, uh, this way of life that the world is going, and it's called hedonism. And hedonism is this uh, idea that pleasure or happiness is the highest good. That's what we should aim for in everything. It should be our way of life. And people that follow that philosophy wind up with addictions because they take pleasure to an extreme and then they can't escape. They don't know what else to do. And life becomes all about just having the next pleasure. It's like when a person does drugs, they're always trying to get the next high and they keep seeking another high and another high and another high. And they're trying to get this fulfillment or something greater that they'll never reach. And so hedonism has various forms. Uh, the point is that pleasure is what is good and pain is what is bad. And so uh, probably the, the most recent schools of thought is you're trying to maximize pleasure and minimize pain. That's what hedonism is. And if you think about it, much of our world revolves around this principle, pleasure versus pain, and always trying to maximize our pleasure and minimize our pain. But the Bible tells us that our safety is not making provision for our flesh, our desires, but instead to put on Christ first and his desires for us. He made us and he made us for pleasure. So he knows 
how to give us lasting pleasure, not the pleasure that is temporary, that will fade away in this life. So Romans 13, 14, it says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. That's what we're asked to do. We need Jesus as the regulator, right? Because as human beings, if we're just left to our own simple selves, we're going to do like what everybody else does. We're going to keep seeking pleasure and pleasure and pleasure and pleasure and pleasure to our own destruction. And we'll never stop. They've done these studies in rats where, um, you know, uh, the rat has to go into the maze and then find um, the reward. And um, they've, they've done this also with monkeys too, where they, they give them um, like heroin or something, you know, to show what will they do if they get um, some heroin. And sometimes they have to perform an action, like they'll press a button and then they'll get more. And they find that the animals will keep hitting the button or keep going back so many times it kills them. They, they can't do anything else. They're just so, the sensation in their brain is so strong that they do it to their death. And we're the same way. That's why we need Jesus. Psalm 1611 tells us, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. <coughs> See, God knows how to make your life a pleasure and a joy if you will put your life in his hands. If you really think about it, most of the things in the advertising industry and in Hollywood, they create an emptiness inside of you so that you can be filled again. And it's a dissatisfaction. But every desire that they promise can be found in Jesus, right? And that desire will last forever. The things of this world, whether it's the drugs, the sexuality, the food, uh, watching you know one movie after another, whatever it is, it only brings temporary pleasure. But God can bring you pleasure forever. And when he fills you and fills your heart, you'll feel truly filled. You won't feel empty after you're done. You probably know this by experience. Sometimes you'll do things for yourselves. You might buy something for yourself and you think, oh, if I just had that object, if I just had that new phone, or if I just had um, something, I would be happy. It would make me happy. And so you get it. And after you get it, you don't feel as good as you thought you would. You just feel kind of empty. It doesn't make you happy like you expected. But you probably also know something else by experience. If you do something for somebody else, if you witness to somebody, if you do an act of kindness, you walk away from that experience, always feeling, always feeling filled up, right? It never disappoints because that's the happiness that lasts forever. That's doing something for God. That's doing something for, for Jesus Christ. And that will never end, right? That feeling fills you and doesn't leave you empty. In the garden, Eve actually experienced the same thing. We are just covering the same ground as our first parents over and over again. And in fact, the things that she was promised, she already had, right? The serpent told her, um, you know, you'll, you'll be like God. Well, he was telling her a, a truth, right? But a half truth. But in a sense, she already was like God. She wasn't God, but she was like God. She was made in God's image. She was made after his character, after, 
Um, there might have been some physical traits in which she was like God, but she was made after God's image. The Bible tells us that man was made that way. And so in a sense, she already had what the devil was already promising her, but he made her feel empty. He made her feel like she was missing something. She made her feel like there was something she lacked or didn't have. And then he tried to fill that with something else. It was the creation of an emptiness that didn't really exist. Galatians 5.24 tells us, and those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, right? So when we become Christ, those earthly desires, those earthly passions, the earthly flesh, right? That sinfulness inside of us that goes after all these things in an unhealthy way or that is ungodly. Christ transforms that, right? We're crucified with that. In fact, if you're crucified, you become dead, right? You know what's fascinating about that? If you're dead, you can't sin, right? It's an interesting concept. A dead person doesn't sin. Christ is asking us to be crucified, become dead to that life, right? Because if you're dead to that life, you don't sin. And then when he raises us to newness of life, when we're recreated, he creates us in a way that it's after him. And you know what he did? He conquered and he didn't sin. So Christ is trying to bring us to this point where, where we put away the old life, that sinful life, that, that life that goes after pleasure in unhealthy ways. And he's trying to bring us to a new life one that desire, does not desire all the earthly things that are put in front of us to our own destruction. First Peter 4 2 tells us that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. The will of God, if you notice in this text, is directly contrasted to serving ourselves and our desires which means our will, if we want our will to be right, has to be given to Jesus. Say, Jesus, take my will, because I will only use it in unhealthy ways. I will only use it to sin in my own self-destruction. So Lord, take my will, transform it, so that I will only make choices that will lead to eternity. It's very hard to help other people if we're not transformed ourselves, if people don't see something in us that's different, right? If we're going to be prepared for the end, then um, our lives need to be changed. They need to be transformed. And if we're going to prepare other people for the end, they have to see something in us that's not like them and the rest of the world, right? So tomorrow... I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some cartoons, right? I'm going to talk to you a little bit about superheroes, those kind of things. And I want to ask you this question before we get there. What are they teaching us, right? Because every time you watch something, you really are learning things. You're learning something. You're, you're coming away with that, with new information. So be thinking about this between tonight and tomorrow night. What are these things teaching us that Hollywood puts out? The Bible says in Galatians uh, 5 verse 16, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So the Bible's telling us where we need to go. It tells us we need to be crucified with Christ. And then it tells us we need to walk in the spirit, right? We're going to be raised to newness of life. Um, I'm going to skip ahead one slide here. Yeah, okay. I'm going to go back once. I want to start to close 
with a concept in Galatians chapter five. Okay. So if you have your Bible or your electronic Bible or whatever you have, I want to encourage you to follow along. I'm going to go to Galatians chapter five. I'm not going to have this on the screen. I'm just going to read from my, my Bible here. It's Galatians chapter five, and it's going to be verses 13 through 26. I want to show you something that I think is really powerful. Almost there. All right. So just before I read this, I want to say this. Many times uh, people get the idea that when you become a Christian, uh, you are free to do whatever you want. There's no boundaries. There's no rules, uh, you know, and they use terms like you're not under the law. You're under grace. Um, things like that, just to give you the idea that you're not bound by anything, um, which is true. We're not bound by anything. We actually have freedom in Christ. But they use it to um, paint a false idea. Okay. And I want to, I want to show you how this idea is actually corrected and presented in scripture. We're going to start in verse 13. It says, for you, brethren, have been called to liberty, right? When the Bible says, when Christ sets us free, we shall be free indeed. Christ is the one who is trying to set us free and keep us out of bondage. Um, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for what? In my translation, it says the flesh, right? Our desires, our passions. It says you're free. But don't abuse that freedom. Don't use it to serve yourself. But through love, serve one another. For you, Brit, sorry, for all the law is fulfilled in one word, even this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, right? But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you consume by one another. I say then, and it's going to tell us how to walk in the spirit. Okay. I say then walk in the spirit. And if you do this, notice, if you do this, walking in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Pay very close attention to what walking in the spirit looks like. For the lust, the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. That means they're opposite, right? They're opposite so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, if you're led by the spirit, notice it says, you're not under the law, okay? Now the works of the flesh are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he's just given us a list, Paul has. He said, if you do these things, no kingdom of God. Heaven is not the place that you're going if you do these things. And if you do these things, you are walking after the spirit. Okay. And then he says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Now, if you look at that list of things that Paul said, this is what it means to walk by the Spirit, none of that is contrary to the law. All right? In fact, many of those things are in the law. 
but you are doing them because you have had a changed heart. You're not doing them because you have to. You're doing them because you have been changed into Christ's likeness and because you want to. Because those who are transformed by Jesus will do these things. And they won't, they won't think of it like it's a burden. They do it because they love Jesus and they love their fellow man, right? And then you're fulfilling, you really are fulfilling the law. None of these things are contrary to the law. None of them. So don't let people paint a picture for you that says, you know, you're not under the law, you're under grace. And grace means you do whatever you want. That's not what this says. It's talking about things you shouldn't do. And if you don't do them, you have an eternal destiny in heaven. But if you do those things, it says not to do. It says heaven is not a place that you're going to be going because you're doing all these terrible things. All right. So I hope that makes sense. Don't let people paint the wrong picture for you. These things are not against the law. You are free in Christ. But he says, don't abuse your freedom. Use it to do the things that are of Christ. And so um, we have a flesh problem, which means we have a heart problem, right? And we're going we're gonna to touch on some more scriptures tomorrow that, that um, talk about that. One of them that comes to mind is Jeremiah 17, 9. It says that the heart is, is um, deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That means your heart will lie to you over anything. It's, it's, it's the biggest liar in your life your heart is. So our work then is to submit to heart surgery, right? We need heart surgery. And there's only one person who can do that heart surgery. And that's Jesus. So I want to close with this scripture. And then we'll pray. It's Psalm 139, 23 and 24. And I, I hope this will be your desire. It says, search me, God, and know my heart, right? Because in my heart are all these evil things that aren't supposed to be there. It says, try me and know my anxieties and see if there is any wicked way in me. God, I, I'm giving you permission. Look, find them so that they can be removed, right? And then it says, lead me in the way everlasting. The way everlasting is the way that leads to heaven. It's the way that leads to righteousness. It's the way that leads to an eternal, um, eternal uh, home with Jesus. And so we need to invite God to our heart and find all those evil things that are in there and remove them because they're contrary to him and his kingdom. Let's pray. And then I think we'll move into our breakout sessions. Heavenly Father, you know that each one of us has a broken heart, a sinful heart, a deceitful heart. We ask the Lord that as we think about um, the lives that we're living. And we think about all the desires of the flesh and how they're twisted and how they're uh, manipulated by the world around us. We pray that we would submit our heart to you daily and that you would remove our heart, put a new heart in us. And in that new heart, write your law, the law of liberty that says we will follow you. We will follow your principles. We will do it willingly, gladly, and lovingly because we're so grateful for what you've done. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.